Have a great session, Jorge. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, go ahead and there we go. All right, so we are recording now? We are. Fantastic. All right, so let's bring up the deck. Let's get this party started, shall we? All right, um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is Jorge Seguera. I am known as SQL Chicken Online. I'm a SQL Server MVP. I'm a consultant for Pragmatic Works. I've written a couple books. I started a little project on my blog called SQL University. If you're interested in learning SQL Server from the ground up, it's a free resource for you to check out. Uh, SQLUniversity.org is the URL for that. And the last little bit there is I am not a lyrical poet. However, I will uh, destroy your eardrums in the next 30 seconds or so because I'm going to do a horrible, horrible rap for you guys. Why? Because it's a vanilla ice themed presentation and it will be the same without one. Uh, real quick, I'm going to do a quick plug for PASS. PASS is the Professional Association for SQL Server. If you're not already a member, uh, go to SQLPASS.org. It's free to sign up. Um, basically, the, the aim for PASS is to offer free training and education for the masses. Um, go sign up, and you'll get the weekly newsletter, and you get all sorts of cool stuff. Um, so free training events, uh, get notifications for events like SQL Saturday. Um, and there's a big conference coming up at the end of the year called PASS Summit that's held in Seattle. And that's going to be happening this year, November 6th through 9th. All right, so I give you guys fair warning. I'm telling you it's terrible. And typically when I do this live, I have an audience member drop a beat, but Rachel refuses to drop the beat for me today. So we're just going to have to pretend that it's there. So here we go. All right, stop, consolidate, and listen. Chicken's back with a brand new presentation. Does your budget get a hold of you tightly? DBA's on call daily and nightly. When will it stop, yo? I don't know. All right, and that's where I cut it off because after this, people are like, what the hell, and we'll be dropping off the webinar. All right, so what are we talking about today? We, we've got a problem. The problem today is that back in the day when you know IT was king, you could pretty much get away with doing anything. I mean, look at look at the picture of Vanilla there. He's just dressed completely ridiculously, but people are handing him stuff left and right, right? And the same kind of thing happened in IT. There was a point in time where, you know, somebody would say, hey, I've got a new application coming in, it's backed by SQL Server. And they're like, okay, well, just go buy a new server. And that just happened all the time. Just go buy a new server, go buy a new server. So you got all these um, database servers just sprawled out throughout your entire enterprise. You get a dozens, hundreds, thousands of servers just sitting out there. And uh, you know that party can't last forever. So you get you hit, you hit a wall, right? You know we hit the recession, and all of a sudden budgets got tighter. You go to ask for a new server, and they're like, uh, no, we don't we don't have the money for that. All right, well that kind of sucks. But you know, beyond money, there's other considerations, right? Uh, having a physical server, you got to think about things like cooling, electricity, space. You know, there's only limited space in your data center. Um, so what are you going to do? I mean, your data needs are still growing. You still got to support applications. You, just, you know, we're in a day and age where just more and more data is coming through, and we're not getting rid of it, right? We're we're kind of hoarding it together. But you know, we, we still need to do what we need to do. So if you got a problem, you will all solve it. So the thing we're going to do here is consolidate, right? You got all these servers out there, and we we got to cut back. We got to cut back, and but we still got to support those applications. So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out, okay, what can I bunch together and still support and maintain my environment without you know losing support, blah, 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 blah. All right, so today we're going to be talking about the three three major consolidation methods. There's actually a fourth called schema consolidation. I don't think I've ever seen anybody using it, 
but it's worth mentioning that it does exist if anybody's talking to you about it. But the things we're going to be talking about are database stacking, which is the most common, instance stacking, and finally virtualization. Now, I'll give you a heads up now. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about virtualization because it is an extremely popular option in, in today's age. Uh, virtualization has come a long way since, since it first, first came around. People understand the technologies a little more. And initially, when virtualization came around, people were afraid to virtualize SQL servers just because, you know, well, it's SQL server. It's way, way too busy of an application to be virtualized. It's not if you do it correctly, and we're going to go through all that stuff. So let's dive right in. So the first method of consolidation is called database stacking, and this one's really, really simple. Um, you have one physical server with one instance of SQL server installed. And, you know, it's dead simple. You need, you need a database, you spin up a database, and it all goes under this one instance. Now, the problem with this is that everybody's living under the same roof, right? You, you're using the same instance, you're using the same tempdb across everybody. You have a single service account that's running the entire thing. So that may or may not affect your application depending on what you're doing. Uh, versioning. So, for example, let's say that when you built the server initially, it was a SQL Server 2005 instance, right? So everybody's playing nice in 2005. And then a new application comes along, and the vendor says, we don't support our application on 2005. It's got to be 2008. Now, that rarely will ever happen because vendors, for some reason, are, are out to drive DBAs crazy by supporting the oldest possible thing. But, you know, you get where I'm going with this. So what do you do? You get, you're, at that point, you're going to have to figure out, okay, where is that new application going to go? So you, you're going to have to put that off on its own, potentially, right? So it depends on your architecture resource. Um, another thing about versioning is uh, something called a collation setting. So a collation setting basically tells uh, the internal SQL Server, all right, how are we going to collate the data? Is it going to be you know, English? Is it going to be Russian? Is it going to be case sensitive, case insensitive? Uh, collation settings do, can, do and can affect uh, instance wide. So you've got to be very careful uh, depending on your application needs here. Downtime coordination. The big one, right? Um, so you have all these databases under the single instance, and let's say for 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 example, say we're going to be say we, we have 20 different applications that live on the single instance, right? And we need to do a patch. We need to do an OS patch, or we need to do a SQL Server service pack. That's going to require outage. So you go to all the different business units. You say, hey, on Friday we need to reboot the server. Are you okay with that? You get 19 yeses, and then on that 20th person, they say, no, the server can't go down Friday. We're in the middle of something huge. Okay, well, what do we do? Well, we got to accommodate everybody's schedules, right? So that can potentially create a huge coordination headache where you're just trying to get a server, uh, a simple restart, but you may not be able to get that for another few weeks or potentially even months just because you got to get all that coordination together, and that could be a real pain. Application considerations. I mentioned collation settings a little bit earlier, which is definitely a concern. But there are other applications that come along that you know have very very strict uh, uh, requirements, right? Uh, so SharePoint, for instance, SharePoint. Uh, one of the best you know best practices and recommendations for setup is something like setting the uh, max stop level for the server to max stop of one. Now. For a very busy transactional server, this is great, but what if you don't want that uh, instance-wide? What if you want parallelism for everybody else? You know, this is one of those it-depends situations. So if you've got an application that comes along that has very, very strict uh, requirements, database stacking may not work for you, all right? And security and auditing, now, how many times have we as administrators gotten word from a vendor, yeah, this account that goes with the application requires sysadmin rights, which is, you know, quite frankly, crap most of the time, right? They, they don't need that level, but that's what they say, and that's what their paper says. And, you know, depending on the vendor, they'll actually strong arm you and say, well, if you don't give it that, we're, we don't support the, the app. It gets kind of crazy. So there's that 
uh, level of security that you have to worry about. How about you know other security auditing type requirements, HIPAA and SOC? You know, is your auditor okay with you sharing environment with everybody else? All right. How about in a shared environment like this? I've seen instances where uh, development and production are one in the same box. What if a developer has access to production data because they're, you know, whatever the security wasn't set up correctly, and they they have sys admin rights on the instance, and they can go tweak production whenever they want. That's a very huge concern. All right, so I've talked about this stuff. We're going to talk about how to mitigate these risks, and the format's a little bit off. I apologize here. Uh, so. HADR, which is High Availability Disaster Recovery. One of the things you can do to help yourself is uh, features that are built in the SQL Server. So we have options like mirroring or always on uh, availability groups in SQL Server 2012. Um, if you're not familiar with always on availability groups, uh, I suggest you read up on it. It's really great. If you're using mirroring today, just want to give you a heads up. As in SQL Server 2012, mirroring has officially been listed as a deprecated feature. So you've got three more releases of SQL Server before they take that away. So if you're using mirroring today, you'll want to look at migrating to always on availability groups. Basically what that allows you to do is, we'll talk about mirroring here. That allows you to mirror the database uh, on a per database instance over to another instance of SQL Server and you can get uh, automatic failover depending on how you set it up. Always on is nice because you can actually group them together and fail them over as a group. With mirroring, today's technology, you have to do it one by one. Uh, you also have log shipping and replication, which are, are more options that you have today. Those haven't really changed in 2012, but you will need a secondary instance, just like mirroring, uh, to basically copy your data over and kind of protect yourself that way. And those technologies are also set up on a per database level. You also have clustering. Um, so clustering, again, requires two or more servers here. Um, and it's an all or nothing type failover. So if you need to failover a SQL Server to your secondary, you can do that. And then you patch your, your idle server, fail back over, and then patch the other one. That one's nice because you, you can fail over and stay up. Um, However, there is a slight outage right as it fails over, but it's better than nothing, right? Um, so that one's nice. You know, in case server one, for whatever cuts off, you get automatic failover to the secondary. Finally, uh, mitigating the security situation that we talked about earlier. If you're not using Windows authentication today, I would strongly, strongly urge you to do so. Um, convert what you can over to Windows authentication. But beyond that, um, not only just using Windows authentication, but make use of Active Directory groups. So what this means is instead of mapping uh, Windows accounts directly to databases, use Active Directory groups. So make a group just for read-only access or maybe report writers or something. Make, make a group for people that can only execute store procedures and map those. And what's nice about that is, from a DBA perspective, you just map that group once, and then the memberships to the groups are handled by your AD administrators. That may be, you know, you may be lucky enough to be an AD administrator yourself, or you just have a, you have an entire other group that's uh, dedicated to doing just that. But the nice thing is, it insulates you from having to do constant changes and frees you up to do other DBA duties, right? And also for auditing purposes, you know, you could say, okay, who's in the read-only group? And rather than put together some crazy query to try to figure out who's where, you just direct them to the AD administrators and say they can tell you who's in those groups. Because in companies, people come and go. So it's much easier if the AD administrators are in charge of uh, moving AD accounts in and out of the group. And from a DBA perspective, we, we don't even have to change those groups, right? We set it up once, and that's it. So the next uh, method of consolidation we're going to talk about is instance stacking. Now, this one's nice because you get a little bit more isolation, right? So it's literally just another instance of SQL Server running on the same bus. So again, uh, back to the earlier 
example, it's same physical server, but now we're running. Oh, okay. Um, getting a note here that a couple folks are having trouble with sound. I apologize. I'll try to sit a little closer to the mic here. Is this better, Rachel? Hello. Hey, it's um, it, it's it'll be fine for a few minutes, and then it'll seem to kind of just give a little bit, and then you'll come right back. So I'm not sure if it is the distance from the mic or not. It might also be the network. So I I apologize, folks. Okay, no problem. All right. So the next method of consolidation we're talking about is instance stacking. Uh, you get a little bit more isolation because it's, it's another instance of SQL Server running. So within that instance of SQL Server, you have completely different security. You have different. You can have different versions of objects. Um, you can have different objects all together. So databases that exist in that instance will necessarily be in the other one. And you can patch the instances separately. Uh, the nice thing about instance stacking is that you can actually have multiple versions of SQL Server. So the first instance that you install on a server is called the default instance. Um, any any secondary or tertiary or whatever uh, instances that you install in SQL Server are referred to as named instances. So uh, talking about multiple versions, the first version that you install the default instance can be SQL Server 2005, but you can install a SQL Server 2008 instance on that server as a named instance. So when we talked about earlier that application vendor that didn't support on 05, well, we spin up a 2008 instance on that same server, and that database goes there, and you're protected. Now, we're still on the same box, though, right? So you're still sharing resources. However, the resources are more physical-based, right? So you're still sharing the same memory, same CPU, same disks, and the same OS, right? So if there's an OS level patch that needs to occur, you still you need to coordinate with everybody again. Um, you're still using the same physical memory, which now it's more important than ever that you set up uh, configurations correctly, which I'll get to in the next slide, uh, the CPU and whatnot. All right, so mitigating risk, resource configuration. This is really, really important. So the first one is memory. Now, the default setting for SQL Server for, in regards to memory is that it basically wants to suck up all the physical memory that it can. So if you go check your servers today, go to properties for your instance, and then click on the little memory uh, tab on the side, look at the max server memory option. If it's this long string, 25379, something like that, that's the default option. You don't want that, OK? Uh, what is recommended, a best practice, and I'm doing air quotes, you can't see it. Um, if SQL Server is the only thing running on that box, and we're talking about a single instance of SQL Server on a box, um, the de facto best practice is take 80% of the physical memory and set that as your max server memory. However, that is not universal. There are instances where you want to shy away from that. Um, if we're talking about uh, consolidation, if you have multiple instances of SQL Server, obviously both instances can't try to claim 80% of the physical memory, so you're going to have to ratchet down uh, those memory settings accordingly. I did a blog post um, at SQLChicken.com that talks about uh, setting up memory in a shared service type environment. And there's also a blog post by uh, this guy named Glenn Berry, who runs down what is recommended memory. Um, you know, if your your server is at four gigs, if you have eight gigs, sixteen gigs, or higher, because the higher you get with your with your physical memory on the box, um, the more that changes. And the reason for that is each SQL Server instance needs it, and also you don't want to starve the operating system for resources. So you want to make sure you leave enough memory that the operating system can still do what it needs to do uh, without affecting overall performance. Uh, next, we're going to talk about disk layout. Uh, in this instance, we we have multiple instances of SQL Server, but you know if we have multiple drives and all your data files are on M drive, well, if both instances' data files are on M drive and M drive uh, cuts off, you can, both instances go offline, right? Because you just lost your data files. 
So uh, from an architecture perspective, you got to think about this. Do you want all your eggs in one basket with this? Do you want to spread it out? If you if your server is connected to a SAN, this is a little bit easier. Um, if it's direct attached storage, it's a little bit harder just because you're still you're still sharing. But uh, you got to figure out how to set everything up and not completely kill resources across the board. Uh, finally, CPU. Since we're on the same physical server, we have the same issue as memory, right? Each instance of SQL Server needs memory and CPU to work. But what happens when they both start contending? Well, with, uh, with the release of SQL Server 2008, we got a new feature that uh, in Enterprise Edition called Resource Governor. Resource Governor actually allows you to control CPU uh, usage, which is really cool. Um, you can read all about that on Books Online, and it, it's a pretty cool feature to help ratchet that stuff down. And then everything I talked about with database stacking still applies here, right? Because it's just another instance. And under that instance, you may be doing database stacking under that instance. So now we're doing instance stacking in addition to database stacking. All right. We're good so far. All right. So next up, my personal favorite, virtualization. Virtualization is awesome because you get great isolation, right? What happens here is that you can spin up a virtual machine, and virtual machine, it's you know, it's just another server, right? The only difference is you don't have to rack and stack and do all this. It's just a virtual server running on a physical box somewhere. So that one physical box that you've loaded up with memory and CPU, that that one physical box is running multiple virtual machines. So it's nice because you can spin up a VM and you can do what you did before. Right when somebody asks, well, I need a, I need a SQL Server, for my application. Well, if you're if you still want to do that one for one relationship, you can do that. I probably wouldn't go that route across the board, but again, depends on your needs. But you can spin up a VM and then just put them there. What's nice is that you get your own OS, you get your your own resources, and re resources has a little asterisk there, right? Because what virtualization buys us is um, it's an abstraction of resources, right? Because behind the scenes, you still have one physical box or potentially multiple, depending on, on how you set it up. But for uh, simplicity's sake, we're going to say it's one physical box that just has a ton of physical resources, but it's still uh, sharing that across multiple virtual machines. Uh, flexibility. Uh, virtualization offers us some really cool things that we simply couldn't do in a physical environment. So for example, you have this uh, feature called snapshots. So in a physical environment, if I were about to do a, let's say, a service pack install, um, if I do the service pack install, I install it, do whatever, start testing my application, then find out, wait, that, that service pack changed something that just broke my application. All right, so how do we roll back? Well. In a physical environment, you probably have to sit there and uninstall the service pack, reboot the server. Um, you know, did that uninstall go cleanly? Did it really rip out everything that it needed to? Because you know, we've all seen situations where you uninstall an application and it leaves a lot of crap in the registry, right? And then all that crap in the registry, it's still messing you up, and you got to go hunt and tech. And it's it's just a pain. Well. With virtualization, what you can do is you can create a snapshot before you install that uh, service pack. You do your service pack installation, and when that, what that snapshot is doing, it's a delta, and it's keeping track of all your changes, right? So we install our service pack, we do our testing, and then we're like, oh, no, we, we broke. Well, rather than go through all that headache that we had in the physical world, what we do is we just revert to snapshot, and it's essentially like a time machine for the server. You just snap right back to the point before the install happened, and it's like nothing ever happened. The machine pops up as if the server was just the way it was at, at the time of the snapshot, which is really, really nice, especially when you're doing uh, multiple rods. And it saved my bacon before uh, I've actually done, I, did, I had a bunch of uh, web applications deployed one day, and I was accidentally doing deployments to production when it should have been QA. Luckily, I took a snapshot beforehand and rolled back the changes before uh, I had a resume updating event. Uh, 
talk about uh, some of the other feature management. Vir uh, virtual machines are really nice because you can do things like uh, in, in VMware, it's called vMotion. In Hyper-V, it's called, uh, I don't know, something motion. Anyways, what you can do is you can actually take a virtual machine, and while it's up and running, you can actually move it to another physical server, right? So again, with virtualization, you're on a physical server that has limited physical resources, right? You have limited memory, limited CPU. But what you can do is you can set up multiple physical boxes together into a cluster, and you can dynamically move your machines across that cluster with no downtime, right? Which is a really cool part. So if uh, machine A, or our host, is what we refer to in the, in the virtualization world. Our host A is getting a little bit busy. There are too many virtual machines on there, so we need to unload some of that work. So what we can do is we can start uh, motioning some of those virtual machines over to host B, and that alleviates the strain on host A and uh, moves it to host B, and now you're kind of distributing your, your workload, which is pretty cool, and all with no downtime. Also, you can uh, dole out resources. So with virtual machines, if, let's say uh, you built a machine with four gates of memory, and you know as as you're going through the life cycle of the application, you're like, well, you know, we need a little bit more memory. In the physical world, what did we do before? We we're like, okay, we need more memory. So go and go put in your purchase acquisition form. You know, get it signed off. Go put in the purchase order wait for the memory to come in, schedule a downtime to turn the server off, put the, put the memory in, boot it back up, make sure it came up without a problem, and then you know the application has enough memory. Um, problem with that is, let's say you guesstimated wrong, right? You added more memory, but it wasn't enough. Well, go repeat the cycle. With virtualization, what you can do is you can shut down the machine and just say, OK, you have four gigs now, now you have eight, or now you have 12, and then turn the machine back on, and that's it. No purchase requisition, no, none of that craziness. It's just, here you go. And you can do that with virtual CPUs too, right? You start it off with one virtual CPU, and when you find out you need a little more horsepower, turn the machine off, get a, give it another virtual CPU, um, do some changes at the OS level to make sure that it, it recognizes uh, multiple CPUs correctly, and then you're off and running. That's really cool, really easy. And that kind of hits my dynamic resources here. So um, that's basically what I'm talking about here. Now, it's not magic, right? You can't just give every VM out there, you know, 50 gigs of memory and, and be on your way. Because remember, in the background, you're still sharing resources. So you could over allocate resources. That's one of the benefits of virtualization. So going back to uh, our our host, our physical box, let's say it has 10 gigs of physical memory inside of it, and you've got a bunch of VMs running on it. What virtualization allows you to do is you can actually tell each of those VMs, each of you guys has 5 gigs of memory, and let's say there are 5 virtual machines running. 5 times 5 is 25 gigs of memory, but you only have 10 gigs of memory on the physical box, so how is that even possible? Well, one of one of the little special sauce features of virtualization is the operating system that controls virtualization is called a hypervisor. And what a hypervisor, what you can think of it is a traffic cop for resources. And it's really good at its job. So what it does is it dynamically allocates resources, memory and CPU usage, across all the VMs at the same time. So when you create a VM and say, hey, I'm a VM and I have four gigs of memory, that's what you see at the OS level, but behind the scenes, the hypervisor is only giving it as much memory as it needs to do its work. And when it's not using it, it takes it back so it can dole it out again. So that abstraction is really, really important to note and understand because that's going to affect uh, SQL Server. So how do we mitigate some of the risk? And this is key, understanding that abstraction the resources are still shared. It's cool technology, but you're still sharing resources behind the scenes. All right. Um, so I've talked about memory and and use behind the scenes. SQL Server best practices still apply, but there's an asterisk here. All right. 
And there's a reason I say this. And it ties back to that first point, understanding the abstraction. So let's talk about some of the SQL Server best practices. Uh, SQL Server best practice on a physical server says data files, log files, tempdb, and our backups should all be on different logical drives, right? And the reason for this is one performance. Uh, data files have a very different I.O. pattern from transaction log files. So you want to separate those out and then you want to optimize the disks accordingly for that kind of I.O. Same thing with tempdb. Tempdb is your heavy hitter on your SQL server, so you want to isolate that guy. Uh, you don't want your backups on the same uh, drive as your other files because, you know, if you lose that disk, you're going to lose your backups and then you're kind of up the creek, right? So with virtualization, what can happen is you can actually build a VM that has multiple disks, you know, C drive for your OS, D drive for your app, uh, H drive for your data, L drive for your logs, T drive for TempDB. You're looking at this thing from an OS level and you're like, man, this thing is perfect. It's cherry. It's exactly, exactly the way it should be for a SQL Server. Problem is that abstraction piece. So behind the scenes, each of those drives is nothing but a file on a file system somewhere. So on VMware, the uh, the, the file is called a VMDK file, which is a VM. Uh, it, it's just a virtual hard drive. In Hyper-V, which is Microsoft's virtualization technology, it's called a VHD file or a virtual hard drive. So they, these are just files sitting on the file system. Now. Where the abstraction comes into play um, is that all of those files can be sitting on the same disks. They could be on the same one. They could be on the same uh, local local drive storage. And from an OS perspective, where the uh, DBAs are going to be playing, we think this server is set up correctly. But behind the scenes, we've se we've separated everything from the OS level. But behind the scenes, everything's still sharing the same disk, so we bought ourselves absolutely nothing. So make friends with your, with your virtual administrators. Make friends with your SAN admin. And you know, just have a little powwow and say, hey, I need this. And please don't put all my stuff in the same, in the same one, which is, if you're using SANs, basically just a giant chunk of storage. Uh, there's some other stuff, too, that applies here. So lock pages and memory. This is uh, a very popular setting on a lot of SQL servers. You don't want that enabled in a virtual environment. Um, Denny Cherry wrote up a great blog post on exactly why you don't want that. And it goes back to the hyperbus. I talked about it being very good at its job and doling out the resources. Well, when it comes to memory, if you try to lock pages in memory, um, it's going to screw the way the hypervisor sees and can get at that memory, so it's not going to be able to do as good a job sharing things out. So you might actually um, be hurting yourself performance wise. And then one more before I skip ahead, another little nugget. So SQL servers today, we buy a SQL server and it has like eight, 16 cores, right? Now you would think if you're going to virtualize a SQL Server, you build up a VM that has eight or sixteen cores with a crap ton of memory. Now, the memory you're good. Give SQL Server as much as it needs, right? From a CPU perspective, this is going to sound a little backwards, but you do not want to just right off the bat give that virtual server, you know, eight or sixteen virtual CPUs because you might actually be hampering performance. You want to start off with one or two virtual CPUs. And that sounds a little crazy, but it goes back to that abstraction, right? So on that physical server, if you have four physical processors, and each of those physical processors has four cores, so we're looking at a total of 16 cores for this server. If you build a VM that has like eight virtual uh, CPUs, that virtual CPU maps itself back to a physical core on that box. The more virtual CPUs you have, the more it has to go out and do the work, and you have no idea which core it's going to, right? Because you know that that machine could be moving across uh, boxes. Um, the cores could be busy because they're serving up others. You you would have to wait for the core to be done with the work so you can get on with your work. So it's actually faster if you start off with a lower number of virtual CPUs. 
and if you still and if you find that you need more CPU horsepower, then slowly ratchet your way up. So that's one of the, the biggies that tends to kill people. And then another little nugget to to leave you guys with is that uh, virtualization can pretty much straight up lie to you. And this one's key for especially for administrators who may not have insight into their virtual environments. So when you build a virtual uh, virtual machine, let's say you built up a virtual machine with eight gigs of memory and two virtual CPUs that are three gigahertz each, right? Pretty pretty standard little box. Well, from an OS perspective, we think that's how much we're getting. Behind the scenes, what your virtual administrator can actually do, they can actually ratchet you down um, based on the fact that they may be over allocating resources, like I mentioned earlier. So they're being very frugal with their resources. So they could tell the VM, you have eight gigs of memory, but behind the scenes, you can set what's called a reservation and say, okay, I'm showing you eight gigs of memory, but I won't allow you to use more than, let's say, four gigs of memory or six gigs of memory or two gigs of memory. They can do whatever they want to ratchet it down and make sure that if your server gets busy, it doesn't run away with resources and contends with the others. So again, this is what where it becomes critical that you become friends with your virtualization administrators and talk about these things and make sure you're all on the same page. Because if they're ratcheting you down, from your perspective, something happens where somebody's complaining about performance and you start digging through all the stuff you do as a DBA and you're like, I have memory pressure, but I have eight gigs of memory. It should be more than enough for the server, but I'm seeing memory pressure. Why? Well, Behind the scenes, they could be lied to you. They could be ratcheting it down. They do the same thing with CPU too, right? So you can set a reservation on CPU. I mentioned you have two virtual CPUs that are three gigahertz each. They could ratchet that down to say 1.5 gigahertz. Again, depending on what you need. So there's a lot of understanding that needs to take place between the DBA team, the sysadmin team, whoever's in charge. Everybody buy some donuts, sing kumbaya, and get all together now. Uh, the next couple slides are just kind of some uh, charts. I'm not going to read them off, and I'm not going to go through them because you can download the slide deck. Um, uh, Rachel is going to be uploading these. If not, you can grab them off my blog site, uh, sequelchicken.com slash uh, presentations, I believe. Um, you can grab these. And basically, it's just a matrix showing you the difference between virtualization, instance stacking, and database stacking. Um, these also call, come directly from a white paper from Microsoft that uh, and that is linked inside the slide uh, deck as well. So again, these are just kind of, hey, what's the equivalent of having a dedicated physical machine, virtualization, do you get that with instance, do you get that with database, yes, no. Right. So I talked about all this stuff. I, I give you your options, but how is it that we get there, right? How do we start consolidating? Well, there's this awesome stuff tool that's available for free from Microsoft called the MAP Toolkit. It's a Microsoft um, Assessment Planning Toolkit. And you can go grab it now, Microsoft.com slash MAP. And I got to stress, it's important to use the singular MAP. If you put an S at the end of it, it's going to take you to Bing Maps. Um, it's a free tool, and it does a lot of different things. But um, we're, we're just going to focus on what you need to focus on as a DBA, right? Um, this tool is going to need some proper rights uh, against the target servers. Uh, namely, you're going to need admin rights against your target servers because one of the things that we want to collect, we're going to be collecting some performance metrics. So you want admin rights so you can do WMI queries against the server, or if you guys are really good with security, just ratchet it down just so you can get WMI queries done without admin rights, but I don't, I don't think you can. All right, so on screen right now is a screen is a screenshot directly from the MAP Toolkit. Um, this is actual results from one of my clients here. I blanked out the, uh, the server names there to protect the innocent. But what we, we can see here is there's some really important stuff that we need to know in terms of consolidation rights. Because you got server A, you got server B, you got server C, but do you know how busy each of those servers are? If you put, if you consolidate server A and C together, is that gonna be too busy? on a single server? Are they good candidates for virtualization in the first place? You may or may not know these things. So this, this is where the MAP Toolkit really, really shines. So here we can see uh, average CPU utilization, average memory utilization, average network utilization. 
uh, disk, and then finally that last column on the right, IOPS, the disk I.O. per second. That one's really, really important to note because that kind of differentiates you know, the extremely busy servers versus the ones that are doing nothing. So I, let me see, oh, there we go. So here, you can see I've got one that average CPU utilization is less than 2%. And look at the memory usage, less than 2 and IOPS are 17. This is, all these collections here are over a four week period. Uh, so I've got a pretty good baseline here, right? The uh, Map Toolkit, Microsoft is going to have you run it if you're going to be doing any, any sort of licensing, if you're switching over to 2012 uh, licensing, which you will be if you're buying licenses anytime soon. They'll actually have you map, uh, run the Map Toolkit against your environment because that actually gives you a bunch of other stuff. But from a performance metrics standpoint, they recommend you run it a minimum of three weeks, and that's basically so you can make sure you capture things like month-end processing. Uh, stuff like that. So you can run at a minimum. They recommend you run at a minimum of three, run it as long as you want. Um, it's kind of nice because you can start and stop uh, the collections and just append your resources. Uh, so it's just kind of cool. I'm going to flip over real quick because I have some other outputs in the Map Toolkit that are really, that are just really interesting. So this folder contains all sorts of different outputs that the Map Toolkit can provide you. Uh, we're going to focus on the SQL Server one, so. So I'm going to open the SQL Server assessment. And again, these these documents are all automatically generated by the Map Toolkit, and it's free, and it's really, really cool tool. So when this thing opens here, we're going to take a look at it, and, it's, and we're going to see the, all the kinds of information that this thing can give you uh, insights into your SQL Server. So here you can see the SQL Server version service pack level. You can see additions, which becomes very important if you're talking about consolidating, consolidating stuff together. You know, are you consolidating two standards into an enterprise? What not? Uh, are they clustered? Uh, I didn't go into it, but if you have a current physical box and it's clustered, you probably don't want to virtualize it that way. Um, just because while you can virtualize, while you can create a cluster in a virtualized environment, it's often more trouble than it's worth because clustering has its own set of complexities. And if you try to virtualize on top of that, it's going to be really, really tough. If you want to take on that challenge, go for it. Um, I've seen people cluster virtual virtual servers, but I'm, I'm just giving you a heads up that that could be a little bit crazy. Uh, so here we see the operating system, service pack levels. But down here is where we uh, is the information that you're going to need. You have operating system architecture, but the processors. Now, if you're for those that may not be familiar, SQL Server 2012 has changed over to a per pro, per processor or per core licensing model, right? So up until now, we've been able to purchase licenses for SQL Server based on the processor. We didn't care about the number of cores. Now we do. So with the Map Toolkit, we'll actually give you is a good outlay of what you have out there. So when you're planning out your, your Microsoft uh, licensing agreements for now and for future purposes, you're going to want to run the Map Toolkit and find out, okay, what do I have out there? Now, you'll notice two different columns, number of cores and number of logical processors. Number of logical processors means how many the operating system actually sees, because if you have hyper-threading enabled, um, you're going to see double the number over here than actual cores. All right, so just be aware of that. So the one you want to focus on in regards to licensing is number of cores here. Um, that also, this also becomes important because when we're talking about virtualizing in the new world, in the new licensing world, um, if you want to license a VM with SQL Server 2012, you have to buy a minimum of four uh, four cores for that one VM. Even if you build the VM with two virtual processors, like I talked about earlier, you're still buying the license for four uh, four uh, virtual processors. Um, I am not an expert on Microsoft licensing. Nobody on the internet, unless they are a Microsoft licensing rep, is an expert on it. The only person who can tell you what you need and what 
what can give you the correct information about licensing is your local Microsoft rep. And I got to stress that because people go out on the internet, there's bad information thrown around all the time, except of course for my presentation, right? Because you know I'm awesome and I'm giving you the truth. But so you want to make sure that you talk to your uh, local rep about proper licensing. Now I keep forgetting that I haven't updated this deck, and I've got a few more minutes. I'm going to flip over to another deck real quick that has another tool that you're going to want to use. In addition to the map toolkit, and that is the SQL Server Upgrade Advisor, and this is another free tool available from Microsoft. Um, so just go out and Bing or Google whatever you want. Um, SQL Server feature packs, and there's an upgrade advisor available for 2008 R2 and one for 2012. There's actually upgrade advisors for lower versions as well, but we probably don't want to be using that. Again, it's free, and what the upgrade advisor does is it scans your existing uh, databases and it does callouts onto stuff that may break if you're bringing it up from a lower version. Now it's kind of hard to see here. Output um, gives you some really cool stuff. So this one here is one of the most uh, important ones in in my opinion. So it's terrible to see the text there, but it says out of join operator star equals and equal star are not supported in Nino or later compatibility mode. So how does that know that? Well, what the upgrade advisor does is it scans all your objects in your database and it looks at the code and if it sees deprecated syntax like that, it does a call out. Now on the next screen, uh, I show it a little bit better, but these plus signs, if you have something here that gets called out, you hit that plus sign and then there's a little link that says view details, and it actually gives you a nice little checklist of the different items that are affected by what's being called out. So when we're talking about the old style joins, if you have a database that's uh, developed in-house and you, and you see those call outs for old style joins, Go to the details, and it tells you every view, store procedure, um, function, whatever, that that violates that rule. Give that hit list over to your development team and say, hey, I need you guys to fix this because we want to upgrade the database and make sure it works. Now, if we're consolidating and you get these kind of things, there's a couple options that you can do. So let's say, we're, let's say you have a, a, a database server that's SQL Server 2000. Right, and you want you want to consolidate onto 2008. That's fine. You can bring that database over, and you can keep it in the compatibility mode for 2000. Now, the database will keep up and running, and that old legacy code that's been called out in the upgrade advisor will still work so long as you keep it in that lower uh, compatibility mode. If you try to bring it to a higher compatibility mode, you could break your application because it might depend on some of that old code, hard you know hard coded somewhere. Um, of course, if you're not in the latest compatibility mode, you you lose you know the latest syntax options that that come with with new uh, with new additions of SQL Server. So that's just something to to be aware of. Um, as long as we're talking about that, if you have the SQL Server 2012 instance, be aware that the lowest compatibility mode that's supported in 2012 is 2005. You can't run in 2000. A compatibility mode database on 2012. So 2008R2 was the last uh, version of SQL Server that supported uh, 2000 compatibility mode. So just something very important to, to call out and note. And it wouldn't be proper if I didn't end a vanilla ice presentation without word to your mother. So that's, that's it. Um, a lot of stuff, but if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'm known as SQL Chicken Online, so you can go to my blog, SQLChicken.com, um, and I'm on Twitter at SQLChicken.com. And I put the bat signal there. For those of you guys that use Twitter, if you guys, if you use Twitter, um, one of the coolest things about the communities, we have this hashtag called SQL Health. So if you ever have a quick question you need to answer, just answer, uh, ask your question and put a pound sign SQL Health next to it. And you'll get your your answer pretty quick. And that's uh, pretty much it. Unless there are any questions in the queue. 
There are. Do you want to take some questions? Yes, please. Okay. Do you recommend using database roles with 80 groups to have another layer of security? That's a great question, and it depends completely on your your setups, right? Um, if you require that, that level of security and complexity, then by all means go for it. Um, AD groups just buys you the freedom to just do the mapping once, and then from there, let somebody else handle the, the memberships. Because as I mentioned earlier, people flux in and out of uh, uh, companies all the time. So from a DBA perspective, you don't want to sit there and have to map and unmap users from your instance. So if you just do the AD group, and that AD group ties to a role, even better. Okay. Um, for instance stacking, do you recommend using different ports for different instances? Uh, you can, right? Um, I believe by default the, the named instances have dynamic ports, but with SQL Server, SQL Server by default runs on port 1433, but even that, uh, you can change that. So if your security requirements uh, requires that you don't run on the default port, you can do that with your named uh, your named instances as well. Again, it comes down to what is your requirements in your enterprise. Okay, what happens when virtual servers require more than physical at one port in t one point in time? Management software to indicate and manage. Read that one more time. What happens when virtual servers require more than physical? at one point in time, and then it says management software to, or MGT software to indicate and manage. Okay, and this one's a little bit tricky because it depends on whether or not, as a DBA, you have uh, access to the management software for virtualization. So as I mentioned, you can do over allocation of resources for your VMs uh, in relation to your physical resources. Don't recommend it, right, because you don't know if, you know, a good portion of your VMs that are over allocating resources are all going to all of a sudden get start getting busy at the same time, and then that's going to choke down the physical server. So, be very very careful if you decide to use over allocation. Um, from a monitoring perspective, uh, I'll talk. Well, I'm more familiar with VMware technology. So, in VMware, the management console is called a virtual center or vCenter. Um, from a Hyper-V perspective, you can manage it using the System Center Virtual Machine Manager, but it's basically the same thing. They're just monitoring consoles. So in those consoles, it'll actually tell you uh, what kind of resource utilization your VMs are giving you. So if you have a good relationship with your VM team, what they can do is they can offer you read-only access to that console. So maybe you can pop up the console on your screen. You may you may not necessarily be able to go in there and change, you know, the server's memory and whatnot, but you can at least monitor. So what's helpful there is if a problem starts cropping up, somebody starts complaining about performance, before you start going down that black hole of troubleshooting on the SQL server side, go ask your VM admins first, hey, do you guys see anything strange on your side, right? Because if something's happening on the virtualization side, you know, you don't need to waste time troubleshooting uh, SQL Server, potentially, right? It, it could still be problems going on in SQL Server, but you need, to, you need to know that the infrastructure is sound before you start doing your DBA digging. So, make, again, donuts and lunch go a long way to make friends. Okay, and that was actually a tip. Um that Doug actually put out there that says to get read-only access to vCenter for DBAs. Yep. And this is kind of sneaky, and I'm not advocating this, wink, wink, but Virtual Center is backed by SQL Server. So if for whatever reason your VM admins are going crazy and won't give you access to the console itself, if you want to get really sneaky, you can do custom queries against the Virtual Center database itself because that's where all the metrics are being collected. Again, I don't recommend that. It's not official, but wink, wink, you could. 
Okay. This is a question from Karen. She says, in the Oracle world, I can create an entry in uh, TNS names with an alias and the information needed to connect. This allows me to move instances to different servers with minimal impact. Is there a SQL Server equivalent? That is a great question, and it's a little bit different. Okay, so what I recommend for clients, if you want, if you want that sort of uh, portability, make use of DNS aliases. So I'm actually doing that with my current client. So uh, in today's world, application needs to connect to a SQL Server, and the name of the SQL Server is Server A. So in your connection strings, you type in Server A. There you go. Now. What happens if I need to retire server A and move everything over to server B? Well, I have to go coordinate with my application teams and tell them, hey, go change all, all your connection strings. I have no idea where they are. I don't know where you hard-coded server A, but go change it all. Well, you can instead set up a alias in DNS, which is called a CNAME alias, and just create an alias called a SQL uh, application name, whatever, and you tell them, uh, in your connection strings, point to this name instead of the actual server name. So what happens there is you tell your, again, you tell your system administrators, this alias points to server A today. Now, when you want to do a cutover, let's say server A is being retired, server B is being popped up on, server, on SQL Server 2008, you move all your databases over to the new server and you tell your systems team, hey, point my alias now to server B. From an end user perspective, they don't have to change anything, right? Uh, you don't have to mess with a TNS name. You don't have to do anything uh, because that change is handled at the network level. So next time they need to connect in their application, they connect and the alias redirects from the server B and you're up and running. Um, now, SQL Server does have a feature called alias that you can set up in your SQL Server connection manager. The downside to that alias is it's local only. So on my local workstation, I could create an alias called Batman to server B. And so for my management studio, I can connect to server Batman, and it looks like I connect to a server called Batman. But if somebody else on the network tried to connect to Batman, it wouldn't make sense because that alias doesn't exist on their machine. So there's a couple options there. But the easiest, when we're talking about uh, portability of applications, use DNS aliasing. OK. I had a couple more questions in the box, but we're out of time, so I will get those questions over to you. All right. And Thank as you. always, our session is recorded. Um, you can um, get this session by the end of the week. It'll be posted by the end of the week. If you go to pragmaticworks.com, go to webinars and past webinars, you can log back in, and you can actually review any of our past webinars. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for coming today. I hope you got something useful out of it, and you can go and start consolidating and virtualizing today. Thank Thanks you all. so much. Enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.